The next speaker, uh, I feel quite redundant here. I mean, we all know him. We all love him. There's a reason why. He stood up to American presidents. He stood up to the might of the Tasmanian forestry industry. He's been a spearhead of a radical pioneering movement for many decades now. He was head and shoulders of, above all the other conservationists way back in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, there's been no time, I think, in, in recent Australian history where uh, Bob Brown hasn't been out there on the front foot earnestly representing our ideas and our ideals in the most brilliant, even-handed, unless of course you're the Bulletin magazine and you call him the Green Menace. The picture on the front page one day, I've still got the poster, of uh, Bob casually leaning against uh, a, a door and this, this term, the Green Menace. Well, there are those that fear him greatly, but there are, I think, everyone, uh, friend and foe alike, admire him greatly. He has done uh, an incredible job of uh, leading and that's not something that he's needed or he's necessarily wanted. It's been thrust on him campaign after campaign from the Franklin River right through uh, to uh, his staunch but even-handed stance in protecting the whales and supporting uh, Sea Shepherd and their activities in our great southern oceans. So Bob is an environmental and earth warrior of the highest caliber. And I think we're just really, really fortunate that Bob comes back and visits us and gives us some of his energy and inspiration from time to time. Because I know I flag, and I know everyone goes through those times, especially in the current political climate, but we lift ourselves up and continue on. But Bob has always been there. I thank you. So nothing more to say. Welcome in a big way. Bob Brown. Thanks, Ian. Bunjalong people. Dawn, Tamara, Simon, everybody. Great to be back here in Bangalore. Uh, I just want to um, come back to a matter that Ian touched on before we move on. This week, an environmental officer going about his job of upholding the laws that our parliament set, uh, and these happen to be laws in protection of the planet, was shot dead. And today I've written to his family, and I wanted to share this with you. Dear Alison, Mrs Turner, Alexandria and Jack, his children, my thoughts are with you in this terrible time. I honour your husband and father, Glenn Turner. His courage and work for a better future for our troubled earth and its natural realm will never be forgotten. I'm speaking at Bangalore a and I Hall tonight and we will pause to pay tribute to Glenn's life. My sincere condolences, Bob Brown. So ladies and gentlemen, just stay where you are, but I ask you to pause for a moment and think about Glenn Turner, his family, and our planet. Thank you very much. Well, Ian just said that uh, I'm a warrior. Uh, that's a great uh, word of praise coming from Ian and all you folk who came down to help defend the Franklin way back. There's only one letter difference between the word warrior and the action component of that, which is warrior. <laughs> and, but what a big difference it makes. And since I got out of the Senate, and I'm a bird out of the cage, people say, oh, we wish you were back there. Uh, and sure, I'd, I wouldn't mind uh, in some ways being back there, but I've never looked back. Uh, since uh, I had the privilege of 16 years in the Senate and before that 10 years in the Tasmanian Parliament because I believe that democracy, and, and it has to be representative democracy, 
uh, is the best form of governance that's available. As Winston Churchill said in 1947, it's full of faults, but it's better than whatever comes next, and they've all been tried. And um, the question, though, is what we do with this democracy. And Ralph Nader, um, who uh, was the great non-warrior but warrior for consumer rights in the United States and stood as a Greens presidential candidate, uh, came to the Franklin uh, came to Tasmania during the Franklin campaign and uh, repeated what Jefferson had said a couple of centuries earlier, and that is information is the currency of democracy. But uh, we live in a world where uh, the information flow lets down democracy. <clears throat> now, I didn't mean to talk about the foreign owner of the biggest press power in Australia, Rupert Murdoch. But there you are, I've just done it. <clears throat> and I wanted to <laughs> just say for a moment, uh, he, he does get a couple of mentions in this book, Optimism, which um, I'm here to talk about at the Byron Bay Writers' Festival and to promote over the next month. The fact is that we live in a democracy with contaminated flow of information. And it's contaminated and based on the interests of the already mega rich and powerful as against those of ordinary citizens around the planet. And it won't be until we find the means of redressing that balance of the flow of information and indeed the power of lobbying on our representatives in our parliaments, be they local, state, national or international, that democracy will begin to flower as only it can on a planet in which we share these days information about each other right around the world. Uh, we exist commonly and depend totally upon a single biosphere on a single planet in this vast universe full of trillions of planets. This is so far as we know. And we above all share a common destiny on this one little life-giving planet, so far as we know, in the whole of the universe. And it's that common destiny which has written through it the need for a power to govern, to hand on a sustainable planet so that that destiny can play out its best future. And there is no other power than democracy which is available that is the power of the people to best chart that future. But at the moment we have a planet which is run uh, more by Coca-Cola, Exxon, McDonald's, News Corporation, the People's Liberation Army, if you like, the armaments trade, the Saudi royal family and, uh, and a few other extremely powerful, uh, powerful advocates against the interests of five billion, and I say five billion, I'm talking about people of voting age on our planet without a ballot box. <clears throat> but to raise the issue of uh, democracy being implemented globally is to touch a raw nerve. We're in the richest, in terms of dollars, community on the planet, and Australia is the richest, in terms of dollars, community ever to exist on the face of the planet. And one of the best, in conventional terms, educated. But I know from, as a Green, raising the issue of sensibly ascribing to the rule of one person, one vote, one value, one planet, in our national parliament, that both the big parties will immediately vote down that concept. We have, and I was there when uh, John Howard, without reference to the parliament, and opposed on that occasion by Labor, as well as the Greens and the Democrats, sent the Australian Defence Forces in to attack Baghdad at the behest of George W. Bush. John Howard as deputy sheriff for this 
rather foolish uh, and passing president of the most powerful nation on the planet so that it may have democracy, get rid of a tyrant and have democracy. But at the same time when I moved in the Australian Senate for global governance, one person, one value, one vote, one value, one planet, so that we might peaceably establish a global parliament to deal with international events like nuclear weapons, armament spending, the international financial dealings which line the pockets of the mega rich against the interests of the very poor. Uh, the vote in the Senate essentially was 74 no, two yes. The two Greens, Kerry Nettle and I, who were there at the time. And, and more recent attempts have been the same. And there's some fear, as a, actually a senior Democrat senator said to me, as we went to vote on one person, one value, one vote, one value, one planet, Bob, don't you know how many Chinese there are? <laughs> and uh, it's a scary thought because there are 1.3 billion of them and there's 23 million of us. But the truth is that until we understand that everybody on this planet is equal and that our destiny is common, we are in danger of ending up fighting each other instead of charting that common destiny. So there's a big mental jump to be gone and I'm, I'm flagging this because we're at the start of a huge debate about governance of the planet uh, into the future. And isn't the planet, besides being beautiful, and human beings, besides being extraordinarily creative and wonderful creatures, in great trouble? And we all know that. Uh, but, uh, and I guess this is the crux of my talking about my own trajectory in life, isn't it true that living with optimism is a far better option to living with pessimism. I spoke to 400 16 year olds here yesterday and boy was the stream of questions from them sharp to the point and impressive. And as I explained to them, you, uh, some of them said, oh Bob Brown you, you give me optimism. <laughs> and I said to them straight back and so do you give it to me. You can't be an old buzzard like me, getting around the world confronting the planet wreckers uh, confidently without knowing that those younger folk uh, are the hope of the future. We tend to beat it out of them, we tend to advertise it out of them, we tend to public relationship it out of them, but in them is a, a collective common sense, and this is globally, which if unleashed, and let go is the saving of the future of this planet. Now when I was younger, well first of all one of the stories, I think it's the third or fourth, is about my father Jack. <clears throat> he was Jack Brown. Actually my grandfather skipped from Britain and changed his name from Spooner to Brown. Now, um, until I hear definite news to the contrary, uh, we presume it's because he was escaping the draft for the Boer War. And I say, I never knew this grandfather, but good on you, George Spooner changed to Brown, uh, for avoiding being conscripted for the Boer War. Whatever, uh, my father, Jack, uh, became a policeman like him. On my birth certificate, they had Jack Brown, and that was crossed out at the end and changed to Robert, which is a very popular name uh, during the Second World War. So I should have been Jack Spooner, but in fact I'm Bob Brown. Um, <laughs> not quite as poetical, I don't think, but anyway, here I am wearing that label. And when I was six, I was confronted one Sunday lunchtime with a hot dinner at Trunky Creek, this is on the old coaching road from Bathurst to Goulburn where my dad was the local police constable, which had on one side a pile of my father's organic but nevertheless 
dreadful spinach uh, and I refused to eat it. And I can still remember his hand on my, the back of my coat as I was take, or jumper as I was taken up to the cells at the back of the police station, <laughs> put inside, no windows, and the door slammed shut and the bolt closed. And half an hour later, after I'd had time to think about my defiant refusal to eat this repugnant stuff called spinach, I was taken back down and sat at the table and had to eat it cold. Uh, and I chided him about that when he became a very old man and was sitting with me down at Liffey and he had a, I said, you know, Dad, that was cruel and unusual punishment to do that to this poor six-year-old child. And he had a twinkle in his eye and, and said, why is that? And I said, well, because after I'd spent my time in jail, you added the punishment of making me eat, me eat it. But as I recount there, that was followed then by my mother's lime jelly, apricots, custard and a sprinkle of coconut, which was a very sweet ending to the saga. <laughs> what he didn't know at the time, and what I didn't know, was that that was very, very good training for a future period of eight arrests, and I've forgotten how many times in jail, <laughs> in, in Tasmania, where uh, it became very apparent to me that besides police officers' sons and daughters, those who did best in jail amongst the greenies who were arrested were those who'd been to boarding school. Uh, they'd at least had some parallel experience. And when we were in the jail in Risdon in Christmas 82, 83, uh, and, a, and a lot of folk from this region who'd come straight down from Terrania Creek and Nightcap were there or up helping others to be processed. Uh, when we were in there, along came one day, a friend sent me a book called On Walden Pond by Thoreau the 1840s American author, who was later influenced uh, Tolstoy and Gandhi and Martin Luther King with his peaceful disobedience. And uh, because he was, a, he was a opposed to paying taxes for the then United States to invade Texas, which was then part of Mexico, and it was taken by force off Mexico, and he refused to pay taxes, so he spent a night in the clink as a result, but he said, when the law is wrong, I'm paraphrasing here, then a citizen should consider making a stand again, it come, come what may the consequence. And anyway, a friend brought in the book called On Walden Pun with a, the subtitle and an essay on civil disobedience and the jail authorities immediately confiscated this dangerous <laughs> piece of literature. And that day, they said, but you've got to go, it's the monthly film and you must come and see the film. And uh, we had to do that with all the other prisoners, the murderers and uh, you know, violent uh, thieves and so on. So I said, what's on? And they said, Caligula, the unexpurgated <laughs> version. And I said, well, I won't go. And they said, well, you'll go straight to solitary confinement. So they had banned the essay on civil disobedience, but forced us all to go and watch the bloodlust of Caligula. And I thought about that quite a bit down the line because it is uh, a pretty salient idea of uh, some of the malfunctioning of our society that violence is entertainment and peaceful instruction on a citizen's right to protest becomes a villainy. And as we are here at the moment, my foundation uh, in Tasmania, the Bob Brown Foundation, pity about that name. It'll be okay when I'm dead and gone, but at the moment it does sound like a superannuation fund for a retired <laughs> politician. <coughs> However, it is a found, and, and um, I'll at least use the excuse that the board won't change it. I've tried to change it to the Franklin Fund and the Liffey Foundation and so on, but I just have to live with it. However, it's there to help impecunious greenies who have extraordinary courage, who are standing up and defying the odds in defence of our nature and this planet's uh, well-being. And so um, it's, a, it's a tribute to uh, people who do make such a stand non-violently in the spirit of Thoreau and Gandhi and Martin Luther King and so many people who uh, these days face extraordinary danger just standing up for our planet. And as we're sitting here, I can tell you that the lower house, the new Liberal government in Tasmania, voted in by the people with eyes wide open, as uh, was the Abbott government last year, uh, have passed legislation 
which means that if you peacefully go and stand in front of a chainsaw or a bulldozer, as we did during the Franklin years in the forests of Tasmania in future, first offence will be a mandatory sentence. The judge has no alternative, a $5,000 fine for peacefully standing in defence of the planet, rare and endangered wildlife, tallest flowering forests on the planet, pristine rivers and so on. And second time you do it, the penalty is three months in jail. There is no such mandatory sentencing for murder or for violent crime. But there is now for defending peaceably what's left of the wild face of this planet which gives us all we human beings are in terms of a reference point, an anchor on the past, and the creativity and the beauty that we enjoy as a mammal, part of a herd now of seven billion on this planet this century. And we're going to face more of that as we go into the future. And I've got a little essay there on the white goshawk, this fierce red-eyed, pure white, hawk and one of them stood above my head in the forest and it does say in the book they have a fierce look about them and she the the, the females the bigger one and i said she looked straight at me and i felt it wasn't just fierce it's pulverizing the look that you get from these magnificent creatures but they're down to a few hundred breeding pairs and they depend on the forest and one thing we can't get away from that if you take away the nesting sites, you take away the bird. No nests, no birds. And the scientists tell us that 25% of our birds will be extinct. This is Australian birds this century. <clears throat> and the global assessment is that on current rates, and they're quite conservative, 75% of the global bird variety will be extinct by the end of next century. And here we have citizens voting through the democratic process to say three months jail second time for standing in defence of the white goshawk with her pulverising red eye. And the question is, who of us is going to turn their back on that magnificent part of the natural ecosystem of Tasmania and the equivalent elsewhere? They're called grey goshawks because they're not, not uh, white like the Tasmanian variety on the mainland. Who's going to turn their back on those because we are threatened with a jail sentence? And as I say uh, in the book, I will be there to stand in defence of the white goshawk uh, because who else is going to? And I, part of the foundation, uh, Judith Wright said to me, the great Australian poet, uh, and feisty environmentalist who, amongst other things, helped save the Great Barrier Reef that we're now fighting to try and save again, pulled me up just before she died. She was almost stone deaf in Canberra in the mid-90s and said, Bob, what has happened to the fire in their bellies? And she was talking about us environmentalists. And indeed, it's a question that echoes down the line with me. This comfort zone that we are all in, in this wealthiest society ever to exist on the face of the planet. This feeling that we can't stand against the odds. Well, it's a recipe for pessimism. And I'm an optimist. And I know that when you become optimistic, you become active. And you can take it as you like. You can be pessimistic and in a torpor, or you can be optimistic and take action. And I'm afraid they're the choices. But I say to the young folk yesterday, and to all of us, of course, yeah, I spent 10 years being pessimistic when I was young and feeling terrible about it and didn't like it and got suicidal and decided I'd swim out into a lake one night from which I knew I couldn't get back. And fortunately, because of my family and loved ones, decided I'd buy a ticket to London instead and got out of the cycle. But then I stood in Piccadilly Circus next to the statue of Eros, love, thinking about the nuclear silos over in Tashkent and in Grand Forks, Idaho, where they're building more nuclear weapons, and young people, the most intelligent, the elite, with short back and sides, are getting ready to press a button if George W. Bush, or back before, this is before Reagan, whoever it was at the time, say, 
bang, let's go. And uh, this is the planet that we live in. But you must, and I, I've learnt this the hard way, we have to look at how hard the world is, how unfair, unjust and unnecessarily cruel our human world is, and then put that on the shelf and get on with changing the things we can. And in the introduction to the book, I repeat Bertrand Russell, the philosopher of last century's great observation. He said, the trouble with the planet is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligence are full of self-doubt. <laughs> well, as I, say, as I say to the intelligent, that's us, <laughs> get over it. Stop doubting. We might make mistakes as we go, but they're not as big as the ones, the, the forest wreckers and the, and the mega trawler owners and the mega coal producers and the defence establishment are making. While we get on with turning this around for a fair society and a safe environment into the future. Now, one of the other things that ties in with this a uh, little bit of merriment along the way. I, I know I've said this in this hall before and I said it to the kids yesterday, but Emma Goldman, the Chicago revolutionary socialist of the end of the 19th century, is trying to get women out of the sweatshops in terrible factories, you know, industrial revolution. But she turned to her fellow revolutionaries, the boys, and said, I don't want your revolution if I can't dance. And this is so important that we give ourselves some enjoyment, that we don't mind if we go on a trip overseas or wherever. Like Paul and I have just been grey nomading on our own out in the west of Bush Heritage properties in western New South Wales and western Queensland, that you can take the time. That it is okay to spend a bit of money on a gift. We're, we're, we're in the, right in the worst of this consumerist, materialist age. I've got a chapter on this religion of materialism run by the God called growth, capital G. But that doesn't mean we've got to go into sackcloth and go to a, ca a cave and, and live with a candle. We've just got to titrate it as best we can till we get out of this and come into a global consensus on uh, how we somehow get through the next 50 to 100 years as population goes to 9 to 10 billion and then starts to fall and that maximum impact on the natural planet and the biosphere upon which we totally depend becomes a thing of the past. Yehudi Menuhin, the great violinist, uh, I was trying to G him up on, on the Franklin campaign in 1979 and I was over in Melbourne and he said, oh, don't worry sonny, don't worry, and he came out and he said, these folk, the environmentalists wanting to save the Franklin, are the harbingers of a new age of Noah. And I haven't forgotten that because we are the harbingers of a new age for humanity and for common sense ruling over the greed which currently has the world by the throat. But we've got to enjoy ourselves as we go. And my view as I get to this end of life and move towards uh, the candle being passed to younger folk, you know the experience, yeah, um, it's just wonderful that we do have this turnover. But my feeling is uh, that we've got to take more time to celebrate the planet. And amongst other things, I'm moving towards a, uh, a regular observance of just stop as we sometimes uh, all of us have done in various ways, but on a routine, regular way. This is not a new religion, this is a celebration of this planet which gives us everything we have. This biosphere upon which we totally depend, but which doesn't need us at all. And uh, when I was 16, I wrote a, a tune, it's a very simple one, you'll recognise that it's just part of a variety of very simple music. And uh, when it, since I've retired from the Senate, I've put some words to it. Because you know, every <coughs> country on the planet has a national anthem. <coughs> if you're tuned into the Glasgow Commonwealth Games at the moment, you'll hear that the only national anthem that exists on the planet at the moment is the Australian one. I think all the other teams failed to turn up there. Because when I watch Channel 10, all we see is the Australian national anthem and Australian medal winners. 
Um, I don't know why they didn't go, they were just frightened of us, apparently, but it said somewhere that the English had more medals than we did, but I can't see any evidence of that because I've never seen one run or swim or, or dive, but you know, this is how it is. There is no anthem for the planet, and it's time we change that. And somewhere this century, uh, a great stirring anthem for the planet will arise. Well, just to get things going, I put some words to that little tune from 65 years ago uh, in honour of the planet. And um, just down the road from us at Eggs and Bacon Bay, is Claire Dawson. Now she was on the West End and before she decided to get out of London, before she decided to get out of the business and came and settled in Tasmania years ago and she's raised her children quite close to us. And she, she's agreed to sing the song. And Mike Gissing, just around the way, who has wonderful talents at getting film together, has put some visuals to it. So here tonight in Bangalow is the world premiere <laughs> <laughs> of Earth Song, ladies and gentlemen, if we can. The, the, the whale footage you see here is off the east coast of Australia, New South Wales and Queensland. The eagle is a sea eagle uh, flying over Magnetic Island in Queensland. Much of the country film you see in here is the Tarkine, including the Tarkine rainforest. And, uh, it's, but it's just a tribute to the beauty of this planet, which is everywhere. Uh, and which we are shutting ourselves off from and we need to get back to celebrate because uh, so much of our future and therefore our own souls now depends on looking after it. The Earth Song. This is a planet Life's only cradle Warmed by the sunlight, it gave us birth. And in the morning, sun to a window, that magic feeling alive on earth. Eagles are soaring above the mountains. Whale songs are sounding deep in the sea And in earth cities, wilderness flowers Offer devotion, set spirits free Wonderful planet, life's revelation Thanks everybody. That's
that's in a nutshell um, what I and I'm sure you are about. And the only thing between ensuring an infinite future for that and failing it is our choice of whether we're going to be optimistic and active or simply pessimistic and unable to do anything while the cocksure get on with marauding the planet. I'm uh, very happy uh, to be out speaking for the planet. I'll be very happy to stand in defiance of their laws in Tasmania if, as the upper house is, seems bound to do, tries to knock everybody out of action. I am enormously heartened by what's going on around the planet, including, for example, the stand made in this community against coal seam gas. And the people who are defying even greater odds elsewhere around the planet, both for humanity and for the environment. The book I've written isn't all about this. It's got some little stories with uh, quirky uh, components of things I've run into my, in my life, but one of them's about a man I met after I'd visited the Tarkine to look for the Tasmanian Tiger at a bus stop. His name was John. He couldn't read or write. He'd come to a terrible, terrible circumstance which cut across his life at the age of 15. But he'd lived for the rest of his life a positive, lovely character born by a single love he had for a person he could never again see. And he shared that story with me at a bus stop and it's lit my need for seeing optimism against the odds all the way down the line. And I say, as I say, I share that story so that four more generations can enjoy it into the future. Where we've got the will, and we've got the love, and we've got the courage, things will be fine. And we can do that together. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen.